Good morning, everyone. And this week we're supposed to talk about week number four lecture. I saw two questions on the Google Doc. We'll definitely go over them, and then I'll open the floor to see if you got any more questions related to your uh, lecture uh, week number four. Right? Just remember, you got your written test two coming next week. That one is going to cover what well, you can take a look at the test guide. It specifies exactly what what you should really do. Right? Let me talk about as usual some announcement just to make sure you're. You're not really missing any important items. Okay. It's mainly about your written test number two that's coming next week. Okay. So this part here is just about your written test number two. All right. Let's now go over one by one. It's gonna happen next Tuesday. However, as announced, as I announced earlier uh yesterday, the start time is going is going to be slightly later, right? Let me show to you how you can look it up. If you go under week number three you will see the test guide for written test number two right that's where you actually look at the guy i'm pretty sure you have seen that already and you can see now i revised the start time rather than 11 30 a.m i'm going to start it uh 30 minutes later but the duration for the test will still be the same you're not really losing any time for your test the reason being uh is brought to my attention that some of you may actually have some in-person activity on campus, maybe right before uh, the start time, the original start time for the test. So I thought it might be nice to give you some buffering time so you can just get yourself, maybe settle down and go to library, go to some quiet spot with, uh, wherever you're thinking about. It's kind of up to you, but just make sure you get ready. So hopefully that 30 minutes will help. Uh, we'll, I'll try to keep this time consistent for the subsequent uh, written test number three and four. As for your only programming test that's going to happen after the reading week, I may have to announce that maybe separately. That's something I will do later. So for now, you don't need to worry. But again, please notice that the start time for your test is going to be 12 noon next Tuesday, right? And then it's going to be until 1230. And the format is going to be very similar to your written test number one. Right, and also you, you can see some example questions for your written test number two under E-class, right? If you go to the E class, you will see uh, there is one called example question for written test number two, right? And uh, well, nine, nine of you already tried, but you know, you still got time before Tuesday, so that's okay. You can try as many times as you like uh, before the test. And again, the same advice as before, you can read it, I'm not gonna waste your time. And for your written test number two, I have not really finalized the question just yet, right? But I think coming up with the example question first definitely helped me to know which direction I should really go. So I think completing the example question definitely can give you some idea about what the format should be. But of course, you're going to study any uh, topics that's not really covered by the example questions, but they, they are already specified in the test guide. And as I promised in my earlier E-class announcement, I'm going to reduce the intensity for the test compared with uh, your test number one. Right? So I'm not sure exactly how I would do that. That's, some, that's my homework to be done over the weekend. So it could be either we got maybe fewer questions. Or it could be that maybe we got the same number of questions, like a 10, I believe, for your written test number one, but it may be the same number, but maybe they are just easier. And which way I might go, I cannot really say at the moment, since, as I said, I haven't really finalized my question just yet. That's my uh, goal to be, uh, to be done properly over the weekend. But that's what I can tell you now. But when I say I'll reduce the intensity, I will do that, right? That's what I can do from my part. And for your part, you definitely want to make sure you study properly. Alish, both ways, not too short. That's why I said I cannot say. I'm saying that it uh, should be either this or this, right? Whether that's going to be both, I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. All right, with test number two being person, so did you look at the uh, test guide over here? Right, it's going to be on E class, right? Make sure you don't miss any impor important information there. All right. All right. Any uh, follow up question to uh, written test number two? Anyone? If you want to type on the chat, you can do so. I can monitor that. All right. I believe everything you should know about the test number two 
uh, policy coverage formats, everything is there, right? Just make sure you consult with it. Okay. All right, any additional questions? Anyone? All right, hearing none, seeing none in the chat. Oh, all right. Let me say a little bit more about your lecture number five, right? I decided to postpone that until next Wednesday, right? Let me take, let's take a look at the calendar. It's not going to disturb your study progress for sure. Let me tell you why, right? If you uh, go to the course website over here, right? And then go to the semester calendar. We are now over here, February 10th over here. So for next week, after your written test number two, I'm going to release your lecture number, uh, week number five over here, which originally there was nothing there anyway. So I'm gonna put it there, right? And then uh, for the Q&A, uh, I think, uh, mm, let me tell you about what we might do in the Q&A. Either I can bring some extra problems, or maybe we can simply maybe uh, save that time, maybe for some extra Q&A session later, in case uh, uh, after the reading, we, we have to uh, discuss the questions related to week number five and week number six. In case we cannot really do it in a single session, we can definitely uh, schedule some extra session uh, for you to make sure all your questions are answered. Well, we'll see how that goes. I'll, I'll be in touch, all right? But in terms of the schedule of releasing your pre-recorded lecture, it's not gonna be disturbed, right? It's gonna be this, uh, still be on schedule. Alrighty, that's about what I want to say uh, about administrative issues for this course. Anyone, uh, any follow-up? Any concern, any doubts? Now would be the time to ask. Yeah, for your lab number two, I'm still preparing for that. I will definitely get in touch. I think most likely I'll release it uh, sometime during the reading week and you will be given enough time to do it. And then uh, later on, maybe in your written test number two or three, we're gonna uh, cover that. Yeah, for your lab number two, for sure. But for now, you can definitely focus on the lecture. I think uh, later on, the, the lab also depends on what you learn in the lecture, specifically about uh, like how you formulate the uh, proof obligation and how you uh, go, uh, go about proving them. It's definitely important. Are we gonna have in-person classes from the coming week? If you say next week, no. Right? Uh, that's something I'll write, I'll write to you uh, to confirm. But that's basically uh, the same as what I discussed earlier in the Q&A, if you were there. Just recall that I said that all the lectures will still be pre-recorded and also the uh, test will be online in the first place. If I have to call you guys back to, to campus to really have the test, I'll let you know at least one week in advance, right? If you just go back to the earlier announcement, I believe about two weeks ago. If you go there, that's basically the discussion I had. I'm gonna write again to just confirm, but it's most likely gonna be no surprise, right? That's about two weeks ago when I spoke about what's gonna happen beyond February 14th, right? All right, any other questions? Anyone? Is there any material from the previous test going to be on the coming test? I would say, the only part that's going to kind of overlap would be you have to be familiar with the ASCII key character, right? So for example, you should really know what partial function should look like in the ASCII key uh, character and also like a relational override, you know, etc. That's something that's also set in your test guide. Let me show to you, all right? If you go back to your test guide over here, let's look at the coverage over here, right? So we say that, first of all, you have to make sure you study the week number three, week number four lecture about bridge controller, that's number one. And also make sure you know about how to prove the sequence, right? And similar to written test number one, so for the mathematical ASCII, uh, ASCII syntax, you want to make sure you're familiar with them in case I put them uh, as part of the question or something you have to type, right? And also I think for lab number one, is actually very relevant to your uh, lecture number three and four, especially how we formulate the proof obligation for invariant preservation, right? So I would suggest you can also take a look. I think that, that will definitely help as well. And Jora, go ahead. 
Hi, sir. I was actually going to ask, uh, I think you kind of answered it there, but are there any specifics of lab one or is it just more how we write things and, and the proof obligations? Yeah, just good. I think, uh, yes, I think that's uh, fair. I, I would say for lab number one, focus more on how the proof obligation are being formulated. Let, let me write it down for everybody. Okay. okay perfect. Yeah, let me write it down <clears throat> just to be clear. Right, so definitely for your written test number two, you will need to review lab number one, specifically number one, how invariant preservation uh, proof obligation is formulated, right? Now that you have more uh, systematic introduction to uh, this kind of issue, you know, in the lecture, so you can review what's really happening in your lab number one and just make sure to confirm. Number two, and to uh, to really discharge such proof obligations related to invariant preservation, what kind of event guards do you need? Right, so if you can recall in lab number one, actually both in the actual tutorial videos and also in the exercises, we said that if you actually somehow are missing certain event guards, for example, let's say you're trying to deposit certain value into your, or let's say withdraw, you're trying to withdraw some amount from your account and somehow the value is going to lead your resulting balance to be below the credit limits. In that case, you will get a variant violation. So what kind of guard should you really put over there to make sure it can properly uh, protect the invariant preservation, right? That's something you want to focus on as well. So I would say these are the two main things you want to make sure you understand, right? That's more relevant to your lecture number three and four. All right, good. So Jara, do you have, do you have any follow-up questions to this or are you okay? Uh, yeah, so uh, in regards to the second point, I guess one of the questions that may be able to be asked is if you give us like a set or if you, if you give us some 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 rodent uh, excerpt, we could expect to say, hey, what uh, garden needs to be put here to maintain the invariant? Yeah, that would be a very fair question. Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah, for example, yeah. something centered around there. Yeah, uh, around there. So I think, uh, guys, I think, uh, well, if I said that, you, I, I'll, I'll make it, uh, I'll make sure it's a uh, happening in that direction for your lab number one, lab, lab number one focus on these two directions yeah for sure okay so it's, it's going to be less like how it was in in test one where it's like which uh relations uh map to this kind of operation yeah yeah okay gotcha. I think so. thank you good awesome all right guys any other doubts confusion about what's going to happen in the course yeah, I think uh, just for a hundred percent clarity, you can expect an e, e class announcement uh, today, Thursday. So by the end of uh, hopefully by the early afternoon tomorrow, I'm gonna write. Uh, I'm gonna confer in writing about the exact plan, how we're gonna continue with the course. But there wouldn't be any surprise. Whatever I said in the Q and A about how we're gonna move on with the course two weeks ago, most uh, mostly would just be the same, right? So. There wouldn't be any surprise to you, but I think it's good to have some confirmation in writing. Alrighty, final call to see if you got any additional questions about administrative issues before I dive into technical contents. All right, just make sure everybody's okay. Alrighty, seeing none, hearing none, let's now move on to Google Doc. Right, I check it about one hour before our session, so hopefully that's the most accurate. Uh, I mean, the number uh, of questions you have, right? Not, not that many, but I think both are good questions. The first one there, uh, it's more like a general background. I'm glad this question was asked, okay? So remember, we talk about the notion of state space. And also we talk about the notion of combinatorial explosion, right? When we talk about a state space, I said that it would, be, it would not be very feasible for you to exhaustively test uh, your model state space because it's simply infinite or the combination is simply way too large. It's just not feasible. So your fellow student's question was, it, will there be some uh, limited number of cases where it is possible to generate genuine test cases, right? And well, that's the basic question. I, will, I would like to talk about two things uh, over here, but of course the exact details, I may have to leave that to your uh, 4313. I believe all of you have to take it is the EECS uh, 4313. Uh, it's called Self-Engineering Testing Course. I'm not sure if you will take it this term or maybe next term. 
But I think in that course, you will actually learn more about, given that we got a combinatorial explosion from the state space, how can we still test our code in a very effective way to really cover as many scenarios as possible? There will be some strategy you will learn in that course. I will just mention one of them over here, just to give you some idea, right? It's kind of beyond the scope for this course, but I think just to draw a connection, right? So the first thing I want to talk about is they, uh, in some scenarios, it will be possible to really do exhaustive testing when the data types of your variable are pretty much small and also finite for sure. If there's infinite, there's no way for you to test it uh, exhaustively. And also it's finite and also domain is pretty small. A very uh, kind of a, not really trivial, but a very simple example. Let's say you simply got a machine or like a class. You simply got two sensors over here. And each sensor got very uh, limited number of states, let's say either on or off, on or off. In this case, if you just multiply the possible number of states for each sensor, that means you got four possible states, right? So if you, I'll just give you some idea. You can think about eventually what you will have is you simply got four states to really test, to really base uh, your genuine test, is, uh, test cases on. So we got four states over here. You can think about sensor number one, sensor number two, Sensor number one, sensor number two, sensor number one, sensor number two, sensor number one, sensor number two. And of course, for every state over here, you have to talk about a particular combination of values for all the variables. In this case, sensor one and sensor two. And in the case of uh, uh, different states, it could be that the initial states where both uh, sensors are simply just off. So off and off. And maybe uh, there will be one state where one is off the other one is on and could be another one is off uh right one is on the other one is off or maybe both are actually on right so these are the four possible states it's quite easy to really come up with come up with them and then once you come up with all these four states so that means you might just need at least four test cases in your j units uh test uh, class and then you're going to set up this particular states and then try to see from this particular state what are the possible events or what are the possible methods that might be called on this particular state? For example, you can say, when I want to go from this state to this particular state, the only thing I would change is really to go from off to on. So that maybe there is one event which is called sensor two, uh, maybe off, right? You want to turn uh, sensor two off. And just another example, and Another two examples, and if you want to go from this state to this particular state, you go from on to off. So that means, oh, beg your pardon. So this one, I believe, should be called the other way around. This one should be called sensor two, actually on, right? We are turning that from off to on. And conversely, we're going to turn it off as two and then off, right? It's a very simple example. And just one more. So what about if you actually go from maybe, uh, that's about sensor two, what about sensor one? Yeah, if you go from here to here, this particular state, you can see sensor one will go from off to on. So that'll be sensor one on. And if you go conversely over here, so you're basically turning sensor one from on to off. So sensor one off and etc. right? So these are just a small number of transitions and also the states you have to worry about. Of course, this is given that you actually got very small state space for each variable. In that case, combinatorial, uh, the combinations wouldn't really explode, right? So that's why you can do exhaustive testing. I would say exhaustive testing is not really uncommon, but it depends, right? If it really happens that you can do exhaustive testing, then you should do it to make sure from every possible states and your you, uh, you should really test for every possible transition you can do to make sure the resulting state is actually uh, as expected, right? That's case number one I want to talk about. Case number two is something that's more interesting, right? I would think uh, this might be one of the uh, the topics you will be introduced when you take the uh, 43, 13, maybe later. It's something called equivalence classes. And for those of you who might be interested, you can definitely maybe look at the Wikipedia or maybe just Google. You might see some interesting tutorial or article that will introduce, uh, give you more detail. I'll give you the intuition okay, about equivalent classes. Right? Equivalent classes is a very uh, common term whenever you talk about testing. You will need to consider equivalent classes when you actually got combinatorial explosion from all the variables. For example, even for this, 
I can say it's already not feasible for you to test exhaustively, right? You can see counter over here, and then we simply say counter is simply of type integer over here. And the integer, we know that, well, if you talk about Java, integer is 2 to the 32 bits. You definitely don't want to write 2 to the 32 uh, different test, case, test method. Actually, it's not feasible and it's not necessary, right? Not to really mention if you got maybe 10 different counters, but, uh, all of them are of type integers. In that case, it's simply not possible for exhaustive testing. Let's just understand the context uh, well, first of all. And uh, let's say we just got two events over here. So we say that uh, we got increment events to increment the counter value, right? You can see counter will be uh, counter plus one and also decrements, which is going to decrement the counter value, right? And of course, I really meant to say one over here. I just forgot to put it, all right? And here we got some relevant guarding constraint over here, meaning that you can only do increments when the current value of the counter is strictly less than 100. You can only do decrements or the decrement event is only enabled if the current value of a counter is larger than 50. So these two values over here give you a very good hint about how to really partition the, com the combined state space into equivalent classes. So what do I mean? Let me draw the diagram to show to you. It's quite intuitive to think about it, but let me just try to make it clear. Imagine that this will be the state space for your machine. For the counter right let's say this this is the entire state space based on the fact that counter is actually of type integer right imagine that so these are all the values of the counter being integer all right that's the uh, entire state space and we know that to simply test every single value over here using exhaustive testing number one not necessary number two not feasible all right, let me just write it down first. Exhaustive testing number one and number two, infeasible and unnecessary. I think unnecessary part is actually more important for you to realize, right? All right, let's now talk about it. Since we know the 100 over here and also the 50 over here, so somehow these two values over here or these two like uh, edge values can effectively uh, partition your state space into three different uh, classes. Let me just, okay, these two, these two values can partition the state space into three classes of values. Okay, so here when I say three classes of value over here, three classes of values over here. So that means for each class, all the values within that particular class will be considered the same if you test one of them. Meaning that for each class, you don't need to test more than one. Testing one will be sufficient logically. So what do I mean? Let's now try to partition the state space just, uh, just say equally, but may not be quite accurate, but I think uh, diagrammatically, schematically, that will be fine. You can think about you actually got values that's actually less than or equal to 50. You got value that's actually uh, larger than 50, but less than 100. You also got value that's larger than or equal to 100, right? So far so good. And then basically what you gotta do is you have to make sure for each equivalent class, right? You can think about this part over here is one equivalent class. And this will be another equivalent class and we got just another equivalent class. We got three equivalent classes, right? So three of them. And for each equivalent class, it will be sufficient just to test one value, one value over here, one value over here, and also one value over here, right? For example, let's say here, testing for 101 
and testing for 100. In some way, it doesn't really make a, a huge difference because if your events or your algorithm, let's say talk about implementation, if that works for the value for 100 at this category, it should also work for 101. It should. But of course, if for confidence, you can definitely test a little bit more, but definitely don't have to test every value in the equivalent classes. All right. So that's the intuition I would like to give to you. So when you really want to link the formal uh, methods that we learned about in this course, we understand about st the combinatorial explosion. But in practice, if you really want to, let's say you, don't, you cannot really afford the expertise or time to really do formal proofs, and you have to do some testing, just don't forget, doing exhaustive testing is not necessarily feasible always, and also not necessarily, is, is also not necessary always. If all you got to do is you want to make sure you understand the idea about equivalent classes. So here, just intuition, if you're interested, look it up and can discuss with me maybe during office hour. But I think uh, once you go to 4313, I believe your, your instructor will give you more uh, idea, more insights. Already, any follow up to this particular question here? Anyone? You might be wondering about, let's say, how what, what would be the strategy for dividing the equivalent classes in the first place? I would say there is no fixed rule. Exactly how to divide the equivalent classes will be completely up to you as a tester. But for me, I think uh, the obvious choices will be look at the uh, different guards for the events, or maybe the different preconditions for your methods. And then you can use those extra constraints to really divide the state space into different categories. Each category will be the equivalent class, right? That's something you might be wondering. Alrighty, guys, any questions about this? I hope that's at least clear, right, about the uh, general guidance over here. All right, everybody happy about this? All right, let's now move on to the next. Right, the next one there, there's a uh, final question I saw on the Google Doc. Uh, I kind of rephrase uh, the fellow your fellow students' question a little bit, just to make it more relevant to your uh, test. When you apply the monotonicity inference rule, right? I'm not gonna. Uh, I don't really have it here, but if you remember, uh, if you recall, let's take a look. And you can see there's a PDF I made available to you. Right? You can see these are the inference rule that we learned in lecture number four. And you can see this guy over here is a monotonicity, right? Right, again, we talk about in the class, in the lecture, this simply means in order to prove the sequence at the bottom over here, the consequence, it would be sufficient to prove the uh, sequence at the top, which is the antecedents, right? You can see in the bottom over here, the sequence has uh, two hypotheses, H1 and H2. But it would be sufficient if we can simply prove the same goal, but with less hypotheses, right? That's the mon monotonicity. It's a very useful rule, but it's very general, right? So the question was, how do we decide what hypothesis to drop? Since we said it would be sufficient to prove the same goal, but just with uh, strictly less hypothesis. But exactly what hypothesis should we get rid of? Again, I would say it's there's no general guidance, right? So I can only just try to uh, use the examples that we did, right? The example proof we did. I can give you some insights into how we actually, why we actually chose to drop certain hypotheses uh, between uh, different proofs. Okay? I would say the general guidance. Let me write it down over here based on the example that we did. Number one, you want to look at look at the goal to see which. Hypothesis might be more relevant to proving the goal. And number two, you want to also picture how the goal should be ultimately discharged. You want to think maybe a few steps uh, uh, in advance just to see in order to reach that particular final step, what should I really uh, keep as uh, as hypothesis and all the irrelevant ones that can be dropped, right? Should be ultimately proved. Okay, let's now take a look, right? I try to kind of put all the four 
final proofs for our four uh, proof obligation of altogether, right? You can see for this one here, I can see all of them actually apply the monoton uh, monotonicity inference rule, all of them, right? You can see for this one here, it, we drop everything but this hypothesis. We only keep this one. And for this one over here, we drop everything except for this one here, right? You can see we are dropping different ones because the one we kept in this one is n larger than zero, but this one is n is a member of natural number. And similarly, for this one here, we drop everything except for n less than b. And also for this one over here, we drop everything except for n less than or equal to d, right? So now the question is, so how do we know which one to drop? Again, I would say, first of all, take a look at the, uh, uh, the uh, go over here. You can see here we are definitely worry about only n. So that means anything to do with d, we simply don't care, right? So for example, let's say for this one over here, we definitely can drop anything that's to do with d. Well, actually, we only got this one left. So this one is kind of straightforward, right? You can think about in the go over here, it tells you what variables we really care. In this case, we only care about uh, this variable. That's only the one that's relevant. Okay, let me write it down. So for this expression over here, only variable n is relevant. Only variable n is relevant. In which case, any other axioms or antecedents that actually uh, has to do with other variables or constant should not be relevant, right? So that's why we can simply cross out anything to do with D, right? So we simply don't need to care. All right, so one, two, three over here. And in, uh, in a similar manner over here, you can see for n minus one over here, again, we only worry about n. So that's why we can only leave, uh, leave, uh, leave this. But if you think about it a little bit further, we definitely can also keep this one here and this one over here, right? These two are to do with the n. But I think uh, this one here can definitely entail this one here already, but not vice versa. So if you keep n is a member of n, it's a natural number, it's not going to be extra useful because you already got n being positive. Being positive must entail it is a natural number, but not vice versa. So if I only cross this out, cross this out, and cross this out, I only got n is a member of natural number, you will definitely get stuck later, right? You want to keep what's going to be useful for later. So that's why we keep this one here. All right. And similar logic here, so you can see here the goal actually has to do with two variables. You can see this one here and this one over here. So we definitely cannot really just arbitrarily, we can we just cannot drop all the uh, uh, hypothesis to do with uh, D. So that's why we kind of keep this one here. Again, you can see N less than or equal to D versus N less than D, right? So these are the two that are useful. But again, this one will be actually more useful because we're gonna picture exactly what you're gonna use eventually. Eventually, I know that I want to use the increment rule to prove that n plus one less than or equal to d. Now, if I look at the increment rule, I'm gonna go, go in there, that one require n to be strictly less than d rather than just equal, right? So that's why I, I wanna keep this one. So that's kind of the second point I was trying to make. Not only that you want to look at the goal to see what variables are really relevant, but also to think about what eventually you want to use to really ultimately discharge the uh, proof obligation, in which case you want to keep those hypotheses that will be useful. All right, let's take a look at the increment rule, which I also went over with you in the lecture. If you look at the increment rule over here, you can see what we need in the hypothesis will be the strictly less than over here, right? So that's why we don't really need to keep this one over here. This one is less than or equal to. We don't need to keep it, all right? And finally, uh, very similar, you can see here we got, uh, this one actually, got, uh, if you only follow rule number one, n minus one less than or equal to d over here. So both n and d should be kept, right? They are both relevant. So the only thing that's relevant would be just this one here, right? n less than or equal to d. So that'll be enough. Of course, it's only a general guidance over here. There might be some specific cases you have to watch out for. Right, so I would say doing proof is not just like a one go process. It's more like an iterative process. Maybe you thought it would be enough just for me to keep this particular hypothesis and go with the proof. And if you're lucky, you can definitely discharge it. If uh, discharge that eventually, but maybe later on you will somehow get stuck 
at some point. In that case, you want to think about: Did I drop too many hypotheses in the very beginning? In which case, maybe I should uh, maybe uh, leave uh, leave certain hypotheses undropped. In that case, maybe that can help my proof process. So it's more like a iterative process you want to go through. All right. Right. Let me make a made a final remark before I take your questions. So it's more like an iterative process. If the proof gets stuck, go back to see if some useful hypothesis were dropped okay you can you can put them back and try again with the proof right that's another insight to actually help you go back to see if some useful hypothesis were dropped and put them back right of course if you try to actually put all the relevant hypothesis back and then you still get stuck in the proof most likely it's because the proof obligation itself is simply unprovable which we did actually right and what we had to do is we had to maybe change the event guards and in lecture number five we're going to see that for other proof we may have to change uh maybe we got to add some extra axiom or sometimes maybe add some extra invariant just to make sure uh, our hypothesis will be strong enough that's something we'll see in week number five you don't need to worry about it for this week all right Alrighty. so that's about the second question any follow-up to this Right, I would I would tend to think silence means uh, everything's clear, right? All right, so now all the Google Doc questions have been addressed. Do you guys got any additional questions related to lecture uh, week number four? Okay, Param, I, I presume. Okay, thumbs up. Thank you. I presume everything's clear. Good. I think uh, yeah, uh, you know, even though the test, uh, every test is not really accumulative, we only try to test only a particular maybe two or three weeks of lecture. But eventually, remember, we got the cumulative exam, which will put everything together. So I think uh, when you are studying for individual written tests, make some notes about which part you might just get easily confused. So it will be easier for you to review before the exam. I will definitely get some Q&A uh, for the exam later, but I think uh, it might be some homework you want to make sure you do just to save you some time eventually. Okay. Alrighty, guys, any additional question for me? Uh, for your information, uh, uh, my office hour today will be extended. It's going to be from 1.30 to uh, 3 p.m., right? So if you got any additional question, you may want to do a little bit of study before the office hour about the lecture, you can come to me again. We can discuss it, right? And you can still ask me questions related to the test, maybe next Monday. Uh, I think next, yeah, because your test will be Tuesday. So you can definitely still ask me. Okay, a pause for one, <coughs> excuse me, a pause for one more moment to see if you got any questions. And don't forget to try out the example questions. I think uh, they will definitely help to some extent. All right. Looks like everybody is happy, I hope. Sorry, you said we could ask questions. You have an office hour on Monday? Yes. I do, as always. Monday. Oh, sorry. I see. I'm just silly. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> no, no, no. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, 2 to 3 p.m., always. If it doesn't work, drop me an email. We can make appointments. All right. Alrighty, guys, uh, I think uh, yeah, if you have no further question, there's no reason to keep you longer. All right. So I'm going to cut it a day and then I'm going to release the recording in case you want to review. But I think uh, this last page, why, what, what I spoke about here, I think I'll keep that as a guidance uh, over here for you. You definitely want to make sure you understand how exactly the proof has been done. Uh, you might be asked to do some 
similar but maybe different proof uh, in the test, right? That's something I'd like to uh, just give you some advice, right? Anything else you want to ask me later, get in touch, office hour or email or appointments. Alrighty, guys, take care, and then I'll see you later. Have a good day.